Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Zoom. And we really appreciate the sponsorship of the Patrick Henry Library and all their technical help in bringing this to you this evening. Um, the, the gist of the program is to um, give a preview of what's coming up in the Virginia General Assembly this month. And we have invited um, two of our local senators who represent most of the people who signed up for this program, uh, Senator Chet Peterson and Senator Jennifer Bosco, um, to speak about their priorities. We will, we will have some time at the very end to have questions and you can put your questions in the chat at any time as we go along. Uh, they'll be collated and, um, and, and given to the senators at, at the end. Um, we will begin with um, Senator Bosco and uh, Senator P Peterson will be joining us shortly, we hope. And um, just a few brief words for those who are unfamiliar with the American Association of University Women. Our mission is to advance equity for women and girls. We are nonpartisan, but we are politically engaged. We have a strong legislative program for Virginia of AUW, and we have five priorities for this upcoming General Assembly session. You could read more details about those priorities on the uh, AUW of Virginia website, but I wanna just briefly list those five for you. Uh, number one is protect access to abortion and women's yeah, rights. Awesome to make uh, personal reproductive decisions with their medical care providers, to eliminate systemic racism and sexism to Virginia law and regulations, to make childcare affordable and available to, for all families, to protect full access to voting, and to ensure full public school funding and protect teachers from harassment and liability claims. So that's a big program. Um, and our senators will be talking about what they hope to accomplish in, during this General Assembly session. So may I introduce um, Janine Greenwood, who will give a brief introduction to Jennifer Bosco. Janine? Good evening. Uh, I am honored to be able to uh, introduce our wonderful Senator Jennifer Boisco. Uh, she has been a champion for so many of the AAW public policy priorities over the years. Uh, as a legislator, she's worked on problems like education funding, access to health care, efficient trans and affordable transportation, uh, and her work in the Senate, particularly over the last few years, has been fighting very hard for paid family leave, uh, which is something that is a, a, a major public policy priority of AAUW. Uh, she's worked also to expand economic opportunities and really help bring students to success through funding public schools uh, and making the schools a welcoming place for all students. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce Senator Jennifer Boisco. Janine, thank you so much. And Kristen, it's really good to be here with you all at AAUW. I have enjoyed working with you all over the past almost, you know, eight years um, on a variety of issues around equal pay for equal work, um, as well as paid family medical leave and voting rights and education and all those issues that we've we all hold dear uh, to one another, and I continue to expect that we will, we will, we will have a, a full agenda this year that you all will want to get engaged on. Uh, I think everybody in Virginia and around the country was really stunned by the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which, you know, really puts our abortion uh, and reproductive rights uh, public policy back into the state's hands. And for those of you who care about this as much as I do, we will be carrying um, a constitutional amendment that enshrines the right to reproductive freedom in our state constitution this year, because I think that it's important that we 
make a statement about it. So Senator Jennifer McClellan, my seatmate, will be the chief patron. I will be her co-chief patron on that bill. And uh, we will be working collaboratively together with the House and all of our Senate members uh, who are pro-choice to, to push that forward. I think that's a very important thing. As you all have probably seen in the news, Governor Yunkin intends to introduce either a 12 or a 15 or a 20 week ban on abortion, which cuts uh, the ability of doctors to make decisions uh, based on you know, best practice and, and, and cuts off a woman or a family's decision-making. I'm someone who had a very high risk pregnancy. Um, I almost died uh, two months before my daughter was due. Um, and I know what it's like having a doctor look at you in the face and saying either you're either gonna die or we're gonna have to do something about the pregnancy. So I take this very personally and very seriously. And I, I expect that my colleagues will as well. Um, as far as systemic racism and sexism, you know that we have done a lot of work around criminal justice reform, and I will be continuing to do that. I've really dug into that work over the past several years, um, serving on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate. And I have really focused a lot on prison reform. This year, I will continue work on prison reform, on profiteering so that people can communicate with their loved ones without uh, a uh, you know, the fees that are associated with that. But also I've done a lot of work with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities because quite often through their inability to communicate like neurotypical people do, they find themselves being arrested and um, being sent to jail. Um, you all might've heard of Matthew Russian who we, we got him pardoned, um, but making sure that, that judges and police have the tools that they need to allow our intellectual, uh, folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities have some options on not doing mandatory minimum sentencing or after a certain number of years of good behavior or having their records expunged. And then of course, uh, sexism, addressing the, the challenges around sexism. That's something that I've really dug into on equal pay for equal work. Uh, we were able to get an equal pay bill through the Senate last year where it died in the House, even though I was able to answer every single concern raised uh, by all of the members. Um, my focus this year has been, and, and will be again this year, will be around at eliminating the requirement to ask a salary history or to answer a question related to your salary history, because we know that those of us who have worked in nonprofits or been stay-at-home moms or worked for the government start off at a lower base and it's impossible to catch up. And so me who works for $18,000 a year would be cut off basically if I had to base my next salary history if I were to go for a, a high level uh, management or development job, um, even though I'm perfectly capable, if they were to ask me, you know, $18,000 a year, okay, how about we give you 25 and then they're going to give someone else 100, um, we think that you should be judged and, and your salary should be commiserate with your level of experience and abilities. And so I'm optimistic. I actually have for the first time a, a counterpart in the other body um, where they will be uh, working it as well. And that will be um, Delegate Maldonado. And I'm looking forward to working with her on that. Uh, child care, affordable and ready for all families is absolutely a high priority for our chambers of commerce, as well as for everyday families. It's a kitchen table issue that we all, we all have to, you know, try to manage. And one of the things that I worked on last year deals with uh, those child care providers who might not have access to things like EpiPens and training so that if kids end up with severe allergies, um, they would have an EpiPen on hand and have training. I will be doing a fix on that to make it uh, uh, more accessible for school age kids. But we know that, um, that there are very serious issues around 
affordable and accessible child care. Uh, Senator Ghazala Hashmi and I spent uh, all this past year working with an early childhood um, as fellows in this nationwide group. And I believe she's gonna be carrying some legislation that will be um, addressing childhood, child care needs specifically and trying to build capacity in Virginia. And um, our school funding and protecting our teachers from harassment and liability claims, thank you for putting that on your list of priorities. Um, we have seen our teachers in our schools put in so much burden over the past couple of years. They've been, had a real target on their backs doing really difficult work. And it is, I think, as we increase funding for su school support uh, positions for our, not just our main teachers, but also those folks who are psychologists and social workers, we, we added money last year. We're going to add more money this year. Um, and we'll continue to support our schools and making sure that teachers are respected and treated with autonomy um, and able to run their classrooms effectively and uh, in the children's best interest, which I think is very important. And I would like to point out that a lot of the talking points are suggesting that, um, you know, we need to change things the way we are, we are doing our curriculum. Our, our process, and I've been in, intimately involved in the social studies and history curriculum planning over the past three years, teachers, parents, students, experts in the field spent the better part of a year and a half focusing on developing the next, next SOL standards. Unfortunately, the report that we made was never made public. And the, the, the governor then went to Washington to a think tank where there, there were um, financial interests of the people who came to the table to create a very fast slapdash um, new curriculum concept and rushed it through with absolutely no public input, no parent input, no teacher input. And as a member of the, the state's um, commission on civics education, we have, we have made a formal complaint to say that they need to bring in the experts again and do this right. And uh, we are awaiting the, the next VDOE, Virginia Department of Education um, iteration of, of where those standards for history and social studies and civics will come. They did postpone it again until January, which at least something means that they're taking it seriously, that they realize that perhaps they made a very major problem. Um, my other priorities are dealing um, with uh, a whole host of things. Um, I, uh, broadband is something, I'm the chair of the Broadband Advisory Council. We have made record investments over the past three or four years. Um, when I started in 2016, we had a million to spend and we have now leveraged with federal dollars, state dollars and private dollars, $2.4 billion to make sure that households in every part of the common- You're hurting my ears, I'll put them back on. Make sure that every household in the Commonwealth has access to broadband, and we will be working on affordability for folks so that they can help get some more of these federal dollars in. Um, I and also I they hurt my I took my earrings out. Sweet, yes. There's somebody who has their mute. They they need to put their mute okay. on. Please remain muted so that we can hear our speakers. Thank you very much. I will also be carrying legislation. Um, that uh, deals with safe gun storage in Virginia. We know that the number one killer of children is gun violence and in an effort to make homes safer so that people who have kids 18 and under with guns in the home would be required to safe storage where the gun is put away as soon as you walk into the house and it's not in your person. Um, 
And that has been something that has been successful in other states. It does not harm your Second Amendment rights. And it would have language that said, if you have a hunter in the family, this has no bearing on, you know, pre pre um, preventing a teenager from hunting with their families. Um, it is a high priority for the gun violence prevention um, organizations, and I think it's a common sense and reasonable step to ask folks and require them to, to lock their guns up in the home. Um, another thing that I, I have worked on, as you all have talked about, was around paid family and medical leave. Um, it we have made some steps in making it available on the private sector um, so that insurance companies now have the ability to offer those pro those those policies. We have not seen a big uptake in in people actually purchasing those plans. The, the, the program that I have been advocating for is a statewide universal program where all people who are working and businesses would put in about the equivalent of a, a cup of coffee every paycheck um, between, you know, four and ten dollars, um, depending on the scale of, of someone's salary. And in return, if there were a need for somebody for a legitimate uh, event uh, where they would need paid family medical leave, like having a baby, adopting a child, caring for someone with cancer who's dying, they would have the ability then at no cost to their employer to step away, earn a portion of their salary through the insurance program and be able to take care of their loved one and then come back to their jobs. Um, it's, I think this is so important. We are the only country in the entire really industrialized world that doesn't have a formal policy. And I will continue working on it until we get it over the finish line. And then finally, the, the, the last thing that I will tell you that I've been working with the forensic nurses, the hospitals, uh, the, the hospitals um, on things around domestic violence and sexual violence um, and victims. And so we are working on having a screening system in our hospitals at all parts of the state where there are forensic nurses who can care for, for people who are coming in with sexual assault problems and domestic violence, and then be screened to get the proper help that they need. I'm also gonna be carrying a bill dealing with people who have been tra human trafficked. So we're talking about people forced into prostitution and add that into the, um, to the screening process. I I'm looking forward to whatever questions you all may have today. There's more, I have more to talk about, but uh, my time is running short. And I do know that Senator Peterson, who has had a very difficult day, um, is calling in and I know he wants to talk some as well. And I, so I look forward to, you know, continuing this conversation. If he's, if he's here and ready to go, then I will step back and wait until his turn is over. But thank you so much for having me. So shall we take a few questions now? Kristen, you are muted. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, well, I think, um, is Senator Peterson online yet? No, he has not yet arrived. Okay, well, then I think probably uh, some questions would be a good, a good point in this conversation. Um, Senator, we really appreciate all of your support for AUW's priorities and your and your excellent work you've been doing. So, um, Janine, do you have some questions in the chat for the senator? We do. Uh, there's obviously a lot of interest in your paid family leave advocacy, and uh, someone asked what happened to an actuarial study uh, that was done for paid family leave. So the actual the actuarial study was conducted. They found that. The Commonwealth actually can implement a program. We need we need some seed money to start a new insurance program, and then they determined the cost what they are expecting the cost would be per individual um, based on a salary. And um, so, the good news is that the Commonwealth has the ability to make this happen. If there is political will and funding available, we would be able to get it, to get it started. 
Um, typically, there is a ramp up time where individuals, once you agree that we're going to begin a program, a universal insurance program like this, there's a ramp up program so that they start taking uh, the contributions a couple of years in advance so that there is enough money to, to provide in the event that, you know, lots of people need to take advantage of it off the bat. Um, there's usually two or three years. And we even established that we would be able to repay, say we did, a, the Commonwealth gave a loan to the, to the program of about 200 million. And, and that sounds like a lot of money. Um, but if this were a universal program and everybody were paying into it, we would be able to repay that loan within the per first two years. Um, and then it would be self-sustaining so that it would not cost the, the Commonwealth um, except for just covering the Commonwealth employees allocation for, for their, their folks. But we already also cover maternity leave at this point. So it wouldn't be as much as you would think starting off from scratch. This is something that is viable. Um, we just have to get the political will behind it in order to, to make it a reality. Did you say you'll be reintroducing the legislation this I will, term? I will be, yes. Um, there were several questions about childcare. And uh, one of the questioners is uh, uh, from the Service uh, Employees uh, International Union. Uh, and I, he's been talking with uh, campus organizers throughout Virginia about child care for affordable child care for people uh, that are members, uh, but for, for all the workers in Virginia. And uh, with, what sort of progress you see we can make on uh, making child care more affordable this legislative session? Well, you know, Janine, I think it's imperative that we make child care more affordable. We are in a position right now, as you all are probably aware, and I used to work for local government. I worked for Fairfax County Board of Supervisors 10 or 15 years ago, and we were talking about the silver tsunami is coming, that the, the baby boomers are starting to retire. There's not as big of a population in the Gen Z, the Gen Y group. And so there's going to be a shortage of workers. And we are, we are smack dab in the middle of that. And the pandemic exacerbated that. And so we are in a place now where employers are having to lure their employees in to try to keep them to stay. Childcare was one of the number one reasons that women dropped out of the workforce during the pandemic because they could not make everything work anymore. They could not work from home, care for their children, try to get to work without a, a, a reasonable and viable solution. And so I've been really pleased to see that groups like not only SEIU, but the business community also joining arms together to say, we've got to find a, a viable solution um, or else our economy is going to really be struggling. So this is not only just a feel good, I want to do the right thing for moms and dads, but it's actually an economic incentive and driver for our success. Um, I'm not going to be, we have a limited number of bills that we can carry this year. So I'm not going to be the point person on, on this initiative, but I will be a strong advocate and you can count on me to support whatever we need to do to, you know, advance our access to, to child care. So Thank you for that question, SEIU. I appreciate your partnership and everything that I do, and, and I'm so glad to see you. I do see that it looks like Senator Peterson is on the line with us, so I will take a moment and let him uh, take the stage. Uh, Again, Senator um, Peterson, you're, I, I hope you, you are, you're on the phone and you're not unable to be um, visible for us. Is that okay. correct? Is that correct? Um, well, I'm trying to be visible. Do you all see me now? <laughs> Yeah. Yes, yes, we do. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I am actually with my wife. We just got out of senior night uh, for the uh, wrestling, uh, Fairfax High School wrestling. And uh, oh, my wife has indicated she can't drive the car. So um, well, let me sort of briefly talk about what I've got going on this session. I will have two bills that I've really 
pretty much had every year that I've, I've, I've been in the Senate, or at least the last decade. One is a bill which is already filed, Senate Bill 804, which prohibits political donations made by Dominion Power, which, uh, as you know, is a monopolistic producer of, of energy. And in my opinion, look, everyone makes and, and receives political donations, and that's fine. But they're a monopolistic provider, and it's always been, to me, inconsistent with our ethics to allow someone who's a monopoly, and we actually set their rates to make political donations. So that's, that's one bill um, that usually gets... Yep. I think you, we lost your sound for a moment. It, which are donations of over $10,000 um, annually. And it's just a way of kind of limiting how much money can play a role in elections. Uh, again, we all raise money, I raise money, but I, I've, I've always believed that Virginia, because it has no limits, is vulnerable to having you know, either private citizens or large companies control the results. And so that that is a second issue. I'm gonna try and turn on the light here. Okay, um, other issues I have, uh, one is gonna be called the PDAB, Prescription Drug Advisory Board. Uh, prescription drug costs have been spiraling for years. And one of the reasons is once a drug manufacturer has a patent, they really have a license to print money because they can set the prices. And the new federal le legislation, the Manchin-Schumer bill uh, through for, Medi for, uh, excuse me, for Medicare sets what's called a UPL or an upper price limit on pharmacy drugs, uh, particularly rare drugs, which uh, have a high, very high cost. And we can use that uh, in Virginia. We can take these same UPL figures, those, those ceilings, and we can use it, first of all, for our Medicaid purchases, which, of course, protects the taxpayer. And then secondly, for private purchases. So that's a bill I carried last year I will bring back. Um, another bill I have I, I, that I'm on a file that's going to get some attention has to do with uh, uh, data centers. Um, I know anyone that lives in Loudoun County or Fauquier or, or Prince William right now knows that data centers have been eating up sort of our rural crescent out in, in suburban Virginia. And they're very lucrative. All right, I guess my wife is telling me to put my seatbelt on. They're very lucrative. Um, and, and I understand that they create a lot of tax revenue. The problem is they also suck up an enormous amount of energy. I think uh, someone said that the digital gateway that's planned for Prince William County would be the equivalent of 150 Walmart superstores in terms of its effect on the energy grid. So I just feel we have to put some limits on this. I'm also very disturbed that they're building the digital gateway right on the Manassas battlefield, literally adjoining it. So I just feel like we, we need to kind of show a little bit more respect for our legacy. Um, those are it, bills that I have, they're gonna have a high profile. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'll have, I think Jennifer said our limit is, what is it, Jennifer, 20 bills, 15 pre-filed and then eight, something like that. It's 25 total. 25 total, okay, I will not file 25 bills. Uh, probably more in the neighborhood of 15 to 20. And a lot of the bills I will carry will be bills that deal with uh, uh, civil justice appeals, things like that. As, as an attorney, I've, I'm very active in the court system. And uh, one thing we did as Democrats that I was really pleased with is we set up a court of appeals that is an appeal of right for anyone that loses at the trial court level uh, before you had to file a petition. And it was very rare to get it granted. So you might have a complete screw up at the trial court and yet you would not really have automatically have relief to the appeals court. So um, I'll, I'll give a shout out to Scott Cervell. That was uh, his baby. And I kind of went along with it reluctantly, if only because if I get a big verdict and it gets reversed, I'm going to hate it. But until right now, I like it. Um, so those are just some of the issues and I'm happy to answer any questions. Again, I'm sorry I was at the uh, senior night, but now we're out. So let me know. Thank you, Senator Peterson. Um, and we're, we're sorry that um, you've had a, uh, a, a death in your, among your staff family too. So our condolences there. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, we, we were, you missed the, the beginning of the session when we talked about some of our priorities that Virginia AUW has uh, in our, our legislative program this year for the General Assembly. Um, among them were um, uh, uh, voting right, protecting full access to voting, right. and um, ensuring full public school funding and protecting teachers from harassment and liability claims, and um, uh, protecting access for abortion. Did you have anything to say on those priorities? Sure. Well, I think uh, 
uh, I'll join Jennifer in saying that any bill that tries to um, get it defeated um, in the state Senate, we're going to lose that. So that's that's a pretty much a hard no. Um, the other issues, uh, full funding of education. I mean, you know, it's funny, you, you full fund something and then you have to full fund it more. Uh, you know, last year, I was the chair of the general government subcommittee and I thought I was the most generous guy in the world for allocating two annual 5% pay increases for teachers. And it turns out that's barely and probably not keeping up with inflation. So we have to revisit that. Um, what was the other issue? I'm sorry, oh, uh, protecting voting rights. I think, again, you'll, you'll see on the Democratic side, we're going to be a pretty much a hard no for anybody that tries to go backwards. I mean, I, I feel like right now we, we're in a good shape in Virginia. We have, we've had very high turnout. And by the way, I mean, we had high turnout letting young one governor. So it's not the high turnout means one party wins or the other party wins. We just want people to participate. Um, it's, you know, elections have changed. And I know Jennifer would say the same. That now, so many people vote early that you really need to communicate earlier in the process. Um, and that's something we as candidates have, you know, a high, high uh, participation rate. That's generally a good thing. Right. Thank you. Um, I think that we've been having questions in the chat and Janine has been uh, reviewing those. Do you have some questions, uh, Janine, for Senator Peterson specifically or in general for the two senators? Well, there are, there are a couple directly for Senator Peterson. Uh, one is uh, any legislation about a disability preference for people with disabilities, uh, similar to the federal government's Schedule A hiring authority, not familiar with that. I'm, I'm familiar with 8A, you know, where we do women-owned and minority-owned business. I'm not familiar with the disability-owned. Um, and I, I take it by the tone of your question that we don't have that in the code right now in Virginia. I have no, no information beyond the, the questioner's question. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, um, I don't have a great answer on that, so I apologize. And Senator Boisco has been talking to us about uh, a salary history ban. Uh, and uh, would you support uh, a salary history ban? And last year you voted for it, I'll just remind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I got to be honest, as someone who hires people, I, I don't, you know, it seems like it could be a little bit of a trap for employers. But, uh, um, yeah, I'll take a look at it. I voted for it last time. Uh, so there is that precedent. Jennifer strong arm is took me in the back room and beat me over a little bit. So yeah, no, that's, we'll see. And uh, this is, I get for both of our senators, um, there are several bills that propose additional burden on school libraries to label ratings of books with graphic sexual content and uh, engage much more with parents on uh, library decision-making. Uh, do either of you have any thoughts on uh, libraries? I actually have a bill that I, there's an archaic, there's an archaic, I'm sorry, my cat is, she's <laughs> the, she, she is a literary kitty and she heard this and she needed to run over. She's Elizabeth Bennett of the Jane Austen. Oh, I love it. I love it. Um, but I, there is an archaic uh, part of the code that says that anybody can, can, um, uh, basically protest of something that they think is obscene in any, like at Barnes and Noble. Um, and so I'll be carrying a bill that eliminates that, that language. It is, our, it is out of date and it's ridiculous. Um, but as a, a mom who did a mother dog book club from the time my kids were very young, like I think it's important that parents and children read together and that they are communicating with one another and they don't have to pick out the books that they think are not appropriate for their child, but somebody else it might be appropriate for their child. And I don't think that we need to make those decisions for other parents about what their children can read. And so I, I trust the, the librarians and think that we need to let them do their job. And okay, yeah. this is Chap. I got a little bit cut off when I got out of my car. Um, the question was about libraries. Mm -hmm. You know, I think in terms of libraries and library books, I typically defer to the school board. Um, I won't always defer to the school board. As you know, I was 
led the fight to reopen schools in 2021. But uh, I think on something like a library book, I'm just not, I'm just not going to dive into that level of detail. I think the school boards are that they're there to reflect the values of the community on something like that. Senator Peterson, you mentioned school boards. There was a question earlier in the chat uh, about uh, someone's feelings that the Fairfax County School Board had been uh, meeting digitally, electronically through emails, uh, and that this was not uh, within the spirit of the open meeting law. Uh, are you aware of this or do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I, I really don't. I don't know the details. I mean, the FOIA laws can be very strict. And if uh, the school board is emailing each other, obviously those emails are discoverable. You can get them through a FOIA request. Um, you know, technically meetings have to be open to the public. So, um, I, you know, I, at the end of the day, I mean, meetings, votes stay, happen in a public hearing. So I'm not quite sure what the allegation is, uh, but I don't really know. And uh, another question for both senators, uh, is there any hope of changing the requirement for a witness on the absentee ballot form? I, I probably would oppose that. I, I think it's important that someone can verify that the person filling out the absentee ballot form is who they are. Otherwise, you know, I think there's just, there's a little bit of room for mischief. So that's always been historically a requirement. I don't think it's overly onerous. So, you know, I'll take a look at it, but. That's my thought. I, I would imagine that this year it, it's probably not a viable thing. To, I, we have a lot of holding on to the work and the progress that we've made that I, I feel like that's where my energy is going to go is to try to make sure we don't roll back the good work that we've done. We've got some of, you know, we, we've moved from, you know, the back of the line as far as voting access to the front of the line and just you know, we've got to hold, we got to hold on to that. So. And uh, then there's another question about uh, the Department of Education's best practice policies uh, dealing with transgender students. Yeah. And, um, they've not yet been enacted and I understand some of them are being revised, but uh, they're causing some anxiety among students. Uh, is there anything uh, do you think in the legislative pipeline or anything we can do uh, to uh, push back against these changes of policy? Sure, I appreciate that question. I was the patron of the bill that 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 laid that out, um, and it certainly has caused a firestorm with uh, a lot of folks uh, have have jumped onto that. Uh, currently, we have we we there was a public process to ask people for their input and thousands and thousands of people did speak out to say that they believed that um, that that students should be treated with respect and dignity. And um, I believe there will probably be some lawsuits that will be coming forward about that. Um, students, I mean, the school boards are, many people interpret it that they do not have to uh, take on those those recommendations. They are recommendations and guidelines. They are not required by law, and so we're we're watching, you know, school board school board by school board as they make those decisions. But again, the the original the original guidelines that we that we passed um, were based in fact, you know, in evidence based practice. Pediatrician, the National, the Association of Pediatricians were supportive of it. The the, the folks who have lived experience um, believed that it was going to make things better. And the mental health and um, you know some of the suicidality was really where we based the need for for such guidelines because uh, kids who identify as trans and by um, and um, non non-conforming, um, gender non-conforming are of the, in the highest level of, of trying to commit suicide. And I'm reviewing a few more questions here. I, I think we've covered most of them to this point. I don't know whether any of my colleagues have any questions. I happen to notice Senator Peterson today 
uh, a bill with your name on it. Uh, I think it was S-852, and it dealt okay. with employees uh, testifying against their employer. Uh, and oh, yes. I'm glad you asked me about that. This has to do with what we call slap suits, where if someone makes a complaint, uh, let's say sexual harassment or some other complaint against uh, their employer, um, and they get terminated, not only can they sue to get reinstated in that position and get back wages, but they can also get attorney's fees. And what I, I'm trying to do is make that part of the whistleblower statute. We already have a whistleblower statute where you can bring a case on behalf of the taxpayer to you know save taxpayer money, um, and, and you bring that suit against a private company. Here, I'm, I'm basically allowing a similar uh, remedy for someone who sues a private company if they're terminated. And it, it arises from a real world situation. I was representing somebody, I'll leave the name and the company's name unmentioned, but uh, noticed that the company was basically fabricating their billing records and they were doing uh, COVID-19 work in Africa and distributing mm -hmm. vaccines and they're getting paid by the Gates Foundation. And my guy said, hey, you know, you're faking your hours. These people can't work 36 hours a day and made a complaint and was fired. And uh, so I brought that as a whistleblower suit, but it occurred to me that anytime somebody has a similar suit, uh, we ought to put them in the whistleblower category um, because it is a matter of public interest. So that, that's, a, that's a bill I'm gonna have and it needs some work. I'll be the first to admit it, but I, do, I have filed it and got it off to the races. Uh, one of AAUW's political policy priorities is uh, supporting public schools. And there's been some concern among our members that some of the governor's initiatives, uh, even the uh, lab schools could divert money from, from public schools, particularly children in high poverty areas. Uh, do either of you have any thoughts on, on some of those priorities and, and the question of diverting money from uh, public schools? Well, I think there's a couple issues here. Um, one is, do we set up different types of schools that are accessible to families that, you know, are in a, fail a school system where the, the local school is failing? Do we give them an option to attend another school? And I've generally been supportive of that. And I think some open enrollment policies, they work. Um, and we already have that on the books right now in a very limited context. The lab schools, I was actually on the conference committee that put that bill together. And I, I'm not terribly sure what the governor had in mind. I think he, he wanted to do sort of a charter school by another name. But because charter schools, you have to, you know, and by the Constitution, every school has to be approved by the school board. I think he was looking for something outside the box and just named it lab schools. I'm, st I'm not quite sure where we're going with it. But you know, I, I'm, I'm probably more open-minded than most. I, I think it, sometimes I, I'm okay with, you know, giving people different options, particularly if they're in a situation where the local school is not getting the job done. And I guess I, I, would, I would follow back up and say, uh, you know, I think it's imperative that the local school board has the authority over any sort of a lab school. We have had some successful lab schools in Richmond, I know, some of our, at least one of our senators attended one when she was a little girl. Um, what my concern gets to be is, is it a public state university or is it a school that has a, a, a maybe a special agenda or something? Um, I, I want, and I, I live in a very diverse area where there are huge pot, you know, several Title I schools. Um, I believe that having a robust local school is the best thing for every child. And I, 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 I have really focused my efforts on trying to get businesses to come in and help provide resources to our local schools so that they are wonderful and that every child has the opportunity to, to succeed and to thrive. Um, and and that's, that's where my focus has been. Well, Senators, we have a, a group of members that are not shy about wanting to reach out to their lawmakers. Uh, what is the most effective way for us to communicate with our lawmakers, uh, both as a group, but also individually? 
Okay, I'll you take that, Chap. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry you've been looking at my right ear because I'm having a hard time getting the audio on this. But <laughs> um, I, I think the most effective way for me is to come visit me in Richmond or attend one of my town halls or make an appointment to see me. I try and meet as many people as possible in person. Um, my room is 517 in the General Assembly building and the code on the door is 123. So come on in and it, it's the people's the people's house. Uh, separate and apart from that, um, if you're a constituent, obviously constituents get priority. Um, you know, uh, phone calls probably better than an email. Um, but my, I have a great staff and, and uh, somebody mentioned earlier that my chief of staff, Kathy Niels, and her husband passed. And so, you know, we're sort of we're buckling down to, to handle that. But, you know, uh, we, we handle thousands of uh, emails and phone calls during a session. I'm sure Jennifer does, too. And and at the end of the day, that's that's what we're there to do. Yeah, I'll agree. So I make myself available in person on Zoom if you don't feel comfortable or if you're not able to travel. Um, I typically get to my office between 630 and 7 a.m. in the morning. So those early morning uh, while we're in legislative sessions tend to be the most productive time for me to, to get things going. Um, I also, I mean, emails. So I, I make sure that every single message that we receive is logged in to my data so that as I'm considering things, I can see, oh, Janine Greenwood from AAUW is supportive of paid family and medical leave, right? Like it's in my face. But I, I, I try to have an open door policy, even if you and I disagree on something, I'm still very much interested in listening to your point of view and treating you with respect and dignity, even if we completely disagree on something. Um, like Chap said, like, that's our job. We are here to serve the community and our constituents. And um, I think of myself as a, a vehicle to help other people um, make their lives better. So, well, right. both senators, you'll be you'll be seeing some of our members. We have thirty so far that will be down for our lobby day on January nineteenth, uh, and uh, we'll make sure that we stop by both of your offices. Great, thank you so much, and thank you, uh, JB, for covering for me the first twenty five minutes. <laughs> well, appreciate it very much. And we, and we appreciate so much uh, on behalf of, of both branches and the Patrick Henry Library that you were able to take time to speak with the, your um, your um, constituents this evening. I think most people who are registered are constituents of one or the other of you. Right. And um, we, we again, thank you so much. Um, I look forward to seeing you in Richmond. I'll be one of those uh, attending on our lobby day. And we'll let you go and tend to your busy lives. And uh, but, but the rest of you are invited to stay on and hear from Janine Greenwood, who is uh, our one of our co-chairs for public policy for Virginia of AEW, telling us who will tell us a little bit more about our state uh, priorities, legislative priorities, and our upcoming lobby day. So again, thank you so much, senators. We appreciate your appearance tonight. And safe travels down to Richmond. Thank you, guys. It's been a pleasure. I always enjoy talking to you all. Have a great evening, and thanks for all you do. Thanks again. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.